that, unfortunately. Uh, rest assured, we're looking at a physical event next time. And we've de deliberately postponed the next time until the 7th of July to try to ensure that we're able to meet face to face. And more details will follow on that in due course. Um, I can see a couple of you have your uh, videos on. We'd love to see you a little bit later, but I would ask you just to turn off your videos for now. Um, today, we're going to look at an issue that's becoming of increasingly of interest, especially in the right light of the recent government consultation. I don't really have any intention of saying any more about the subject, because frankly, I know very little about it. Um, I'll just say I'm delighted to welcome you again this evening. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Valencia. I'm the Regional Director for the South East, which includes uh, London Branch. And today's discussion brings together the Chair of London Branch, Victoria Vivian, and Professor Jonathan Jones. Uh, now, just to go on to the format for the moment, please keep your microphone and video on mute, as I said. You can ask questions during, um, during the talk and during the discussion, as well as throughout the event, uh, just by using the chat button below. And a Q&A will follow uh, the discussion of the talk, uh, during which time we'll ask you to come to the virtual stage and ask your question um, on a live basis, if you so wish. At that stage, just unmute your microphone and camera um, and ask away. If you need any help, during the, uh, during, the, um, during the event, do please speak to our event manager, Pip Watkins, via chat uh, or just text her. Um, as ever, I should remind you that the session's being recorded. Thank you very much. I'll now hand you over to Victoria and Jonathan. Good evening everybody and as Michael's already said uh, uh, a big welcome to our London branch members. I became the chair of the London branch in December and we've yet to meet in person but fingers crossed that is exactly what will, will happen in July. A welcome too to the wider membership who, who we um, opened this invitation to because we felt this was such an important subject um, for the CLA to be um, Grasp, grasping and grappling with, um, particularly this year um, as the year of the consultation. And of course, my final and welcome and thanks is for Professor Jonathan Jones, who has uh, agreed to come to meet us and to talk to us this evening. The subject for tonight's London branch meeting is, as you all know, gene editing. In January, the government launched a request for views on genetic technologies broadly and specifically as a part of that on gene editing and as on the regulation of technologies of organisms produced by gene editing. Consultation opened in January and it closed in March. At the CLA it was debated pretty thoroughly at the Agriculture and Land Use Committee and also in the Environment Committee but it was quite a short window uh, for us to respond to that consultation. There was uh, expected to be by DEFRA, and I think we can also expect it to be true, a spectrum of opinions on this subject. Um, Professor Jones has uh, generously accepted this invitation to speak at tonight's London branch. And um, I would be, as Michael, I think has already said, absurd and pretentious if I tried to list his academic um, achievements in, in the past. I'm not a scientist and I would sound like I was making it up. But what I do know is that via Cambridge, Harvard and California to the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich, um, his research programmes have led him to being one of the most frequently cited plant scientists in Europe. Perhaps in the popular mind and in my mind as well, he's uh, most well known for being credited with isolating genes from crop wild relatives that are resistant to potato late blight but I'm sure that's a very small, in fact, I know that that is a very small part of what he has done. So welcome to Professor Jones this evening. Um, we're going to um, have a, a, a lecture from him on, on the subject of genetic modification and gene editing. And we're going to leave you know, 20 minutes at the end in order for everybody to, um, to, to, to ask their questions. And I hope that Michael and Pip will help me to uh, gather those questions together and get you in person to ask them of Professor Jones. Thank you very much.
Well, good evening, everyone. Let's just check my share screen works. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I should also thank Ferris and Vivian for hosting me and my family for a very nice lunch uh, a couple of years ago down on the Lizard. Um, so I'm, uh, brace yourself for a little bit of a rant. Um, I'm going to be telling you why I'm so uh, supportive of making the most of these uh, genetic technologies to reduce the environmental impact of agriculture and increase sustainability and, and increase uh, yields. So <clears throat> here's my title. Um, and I'm going to, in, in time honored uh, manner, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you before I tell you. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you that the, the use of both GM and gene editing methods are benign uh, and useful. Uh, these tools can elevate crop yields and help us replace chemistry uh, with genetics for disease and pest control. Um, currently in the European Union, these are, uh, the regulation of these technologies is completely dysfunctional uh, uh, and disproportionate to actual any hyp uh, hypothetical risks. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about gene editing. It's a distinct method that enables you to do some things you couldn't you do with the, uh, the GM method, precisely tweak uh, nucleotide sequences in plant genomes and also to deliver new genes at, at precise locations. Um, and that whatever you may or may not feel about Brexit, I confess I've been on all three big anti-Brexit demonstrations in London a few years ago, back when we thought it was worth doing. Um, <coughs> nevertheless, enabling the UK to make its own rules for regulating crop genetic improvement is something to be welcomed. So uh, <coughs> when people talk or think about food and crops, um, they have this idea that there was this sort of natural state of crops that people are now messing with. Uh, 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 and if anything, uh, the reverse is true. We've been messing with crops for a very, very long time. And if we hadn't, uh, many of them would be completely inedible. So you can see some images here of what watermelons, maize, bananas, egg, uh, aubergine, etc. used to look like before uh, uh, the plant breeders or, or, or early farmers got their hands on them. Um, so this is what a natural maize looks like. Um, it's completely, uh, more or less completely inedible. And over many generations, it was turned into something we're now more familiar with. This is what tomatoes used to look like, and this is what the plant breeders have, have done to them. So you could question about whether or not it's natural. Frankly, it's just not a very relevant question to my mind. But I think what we can say is that all most crops are barely recognizable in their ancestors and so they have been um, modified through genetics. So, so I've always had winced at the term genetically modified, nevertheless we have to use it because it's common parlance. But it's worth reflecting on, on what it means because if you call something modified it begs the question modified from what? Um, so and, and Darwin when he was asked to um, sum up his theory of evolution by natural selection in the most succinct possible way. He said, um, descent with modification. So what is descent if not genetics? So in other words, if it wasn't for heritable variation uh, and new mutations, uh, we would not be, there would have been no evolution. Um, so uh, another question I pose to people who, who want to discuss what is and is not natural uh, is to point out to them, that uh, it's not natural for maize, tomato, potato, sunflower, and a number of other crops to have been brought from the Americas to Europe where they were never grown before. So agriculture is unnatural. Uh, and, and without higher yielding varieties, food prices will be higher and we would need more land for agriculture. And what's very clear, if you look at the absolute catastrophe going on for world biodiversity, um, if we didn't need so much land for agriculture, we would be imposing less a burden, a less of a burden on those uh, so far um, uh, still wilderness areas. And, and this is required science. So I don't need to tell this audience probably, you can't underestimate how hard it is to actually have a high productivity in agriculture. Yield is good. The more yield you have, the less land you need for agriculture. And I would argue we need every tool in the toolbox uh, to achieve that. Um, so executive summary of this section, agriculture is unnatural, uh, get over it. Um, so <clears throat> sustainable agriculture is challenging. Um, I've been part of this report from uh, 12 years ago now 
from the Royal Society, uh, other similar learned bodies uh, have, have looked into um, what it takes for, quote, sustainable uh, intensification. And, and the conclusion is, as, as I just said, we need every tool in the toolbox. And one of the things that frustrates me is that um, something that used to frustrate people working in the energy and climate change sphere. So, so you'd, you'd have a discussion about energy security and some people would say, oh no, we just need uh, better insulation in buildings or we just need uh, electric cars or we just need photovoltaics and wind uh, to replace uh, coal. Well, actually we need all of these things. Let's not have a false antithesis. And similarly for food security and addressing the climate change uh, uh, sustainability issues around agriculture, we don't just need to reduce food waste. We don't just need more research on, on agronomy methods. We don't just need reduced meat consumption, I would argue. Um, we need all of the above, and that includes all of the genetic tools for crop improvement, breeding, GM, and, uh, and editing. So <clears throat> I've used the word gene quite a lot. I know it's, it's, it's part of my daily uh, uh, toolbox to use the word gene and, and know what it means. I know that's not true for everyone on the line here. So let me just say a few um, things about genes. So most plants carry about, you know, 30,000 if not more genes. Uh, about the same number as we do, if not slightly more. Um, what, what are genes? Well, they actually what they do is they specify the sequence of the amino acids in a protein. So if you've got a an amino acid, a protein of 300 amino acids, let's say at every position, it could be one of 20 amino acids. And, and, that, and what that sequence of amino acids is, is encoded by the genes. Um, <clears throat> now, genes encode proteins, what are proteins? Well, they're actually they're tiny machines for doing a job. They can either do a chemical job, like an enzyme that facilitates a chemical reaction, or a physical job, like a, a muscle protein. Um, <clears throat> now, Genes, uh, like I say, encode these proteins, but you can have changes in the nucleotide sequence uh, resulting in a mutation in the gene. Either you don't get a protein at all, uh, in fact most uh, mutations give you that, or sometimes you can get different forms of the gene that give you a slightly different form of the protein. These forms of the gene are called alleles, and you could then have an altered uh, uh, um, uh, function of the protein. Sometimes this is a good thing. You may have a protein that allele, the, the form of the protein that works better at a high temperature, uh, for example, than another. Um, but the real point is this, that there's tremendous variation. And, and in the last 10 years, we've learned an unbelievable amount about how much variation there is within populations for um, uh, in, in all these genes. So crops and their ancestors carry enormous genetic variation, and that's used by plant breeders. And what they do is they, they find an allele here, a form of a gene here, another form of a gene there, and they have to create the combination. In fact, it's called recombination. You, you, you put the right combinations of forms of genes together, and then you've got a variety if you do it, uh, if you combine enough good alleles, enough good forms of gene. So that's what behind plant breeding. Um, now GM, uh, it's just a method, first of all. It's not a thing. I, I mean, I hate it when people sometimes say to me, I don't want food with GMs in. You know, this is, I'm sorry, a meaningless statement if you've ever said it to anybody. Um, it, GM is just a method to add some DNA to, to plant chromosomes. So a typical plant has got several chromosomes. This is where all the DNA resides. And so here, this is a representation of, let's say, six chromosomes in a hypothetical plant. Um, and what the GM method mostly relies on is a, a natural bacterium called agrobacterium that naturally delivers a bit of DNA into a plant. And what that bit of DNA from agrobacterium does is to prov provoke the plant's cells to grow uncontrollably and then make a, some special molecules that only the agrobacterium can grow on. So it's just part of the virulence strategy of this agrobacterium. Uh, so uh, there's a bit of DNA um, that's cut out of a particular uh, circle of DNA in the, in the bacterium cell, and then it gets transferred into um, uh, the plant uh, chromosome. And so it ends up somewhere like this. So what you have is a bit of DNA stuck into all this other DNA. You may have a chromosome of 100 million bases here and you put in 10,000 bases here. So it's, it's a slight change, but it's, uh, it's a change. It turns out that some crops, um, the sweet potato, um, was, was, uh, it was discovered fairly recently, um, actually carries some agrobacterium DNA already. It's like 
um, uh, 3,000 years ago or so, it picked up a bit of DNA from Agrobacterium. And so this has been a, a transgenic crop for 3,000 years. And some of my friends have mischievously suggested that maybe we should use gene editing to cut out the tDNA from this uh, sweet potato so it's no longer GM. It's all right, that's not a serious uh, suggestion. Now, something we've learned in the last few years is that there's incredible genetic variation within any plant species. So here's a, consider, here's a chromosome of a particular maize inbred, just one of the 10 chromosomes. So here's another one, here's another inbred, here's another inbred. And if you compare the sequences of these, you can see that there's a whole bunch of difference. There's a bunch of DNA missing in, in say this chromosome uh, compared to this chromosome or and there's different DNA missing in this chromosome and there's different DNA missing in this chromosome compared to this chromosome. And then if you compare the DNA in this chromosome to all of these guys, guess what? There's a bunch of DNA missing over here as well. So the point of what I'm saying here is that the variation within plant species is enormous. Typically a maize inbred um, may carry 6,000 genes that are not in another maize inbred. So the genetic vari introdu variation introduced by GM or I'll get to later by editing, is absolutely tiny in comparison to the variation that's already there. And this is something we've learned from the enormous uh, explosion in, in DNA sequence analysis of plant genomes from the last 10 years. The amount of variation we're introducing with a bit of GM or a bit of editing is a pimple on the buttock of the absolutely enormous mountain of variation that's already there. Um, so, uh, GM wasn't always controversial, of course. Um, some of you may remember these Sainsbury's uh, tomato puree uh, in the 90s until neurosis broke out about whether or not there was a, a, a danger in the method. Um, here's another way to think about the method. This is a sort of a way of illustrating the point I was making about a bit of DNA going in. So if you add an app to your iPhone, and, and, and the age of these iPhones tell you how long I've been showing this slide, um, it's still an iPhone but with some added function with an extra app. So if you add a gene to a potato that's got say 60,000 genes, it's still a potato, but it's got an added uh, uh, functionality. And, and with respect to the method, the use of the GM method, and, and the same is true of gene editing, all learned societies, the Royal Society, US National Academy of Sciences, uh, the European Academy, ESAC, the method is safe and on balance benign. And, and the regulations that we're currently wrestling with, especially in the EU, are based on the idea there might be some unknown unknowns that we didn't even know we didn't know about, uh, about use of the method. And that's really just no longer true. We know what goes on uh, and we can evaluate what went on in any particular um, line that results from use of the GM method. There aren't any unknown unknowns anymore. So the real question is what kind of agriculture we want and what we use it for. So the first GM crops had one, mostly had one of two traits. They either had herbicide tolerance, um, which you may not be too thrilled about, but it does help control weeds with a more benign herbicide, glyphosate, than the nastier herbicides it replaced. Indeed, the use of Roundup Ready soybeans actually led to American cyanamid that made some rather nasty herbicides completely going out of business because the demand for its products collapsed. And frankly, that's a good thing. Um, another application was the expression of insect resistance genes uh, from something called Bacillus thuringiensis. And this is a bacterium uh, that uh, organic farmers actually spray on their crops to, uh, to uh, reduce losses to insects. Um, <clears throat> those aren't the only applications. So there was, it also, the, the, the method was used to save the Hawaiian papaya industry from papaya ring, from papaya ring spot virus. But, but those are the two main uses. But now we know so much more about genes and useful genes in crops that there's gonna be a lot to do moving genes from one plant to another. We just got a, I mean, a plant gene that does something useful in one plant uh, can, can be moved into another to confer that useful property in another plant. And that's what we do uh, with our disease resistance program. But I'm gonna make a couple of other points um, this is a, a slide from the, uh, uh, the Bet Noir, some uh, Monsanto, but it illustrates the benefits of these technologies, not just to the intended uh, 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 property, rootworm control in this case, but also to, again, in this case, water use efficiency. So basically the executive summary of this slide is that if your roots have been eaten by rootworm, 
then you actually are much um, less efficient in your use of water if you're a plant. Whereas the rootworm protected, rootworm protected plants can make do with much less water. They have a much higher water use efficiency. So there's a, um, even though it's an insect resistant trait, it actually has abiotic stress uh, uh, value. Um, <clears throat> so are GM crops safe? <laughs> People ask this question. So yeah, like I say, this BT gene is used by uh, organic farmers. Um, and it's the same protein, whether it's made in the plant or, or sprayed on the plant uh, in, in bacteria. There's no way that the DNA in a plant introduced by GM can actually genetically modify anything that eats it. Um, people worry about um, admixture. Uh, they like to call it contamination if they're opposed to the technology. Um, this is not a real problem. This is a, a, a regulatory problem or a synthetic problem. And I would make the point that insect resistant maize is actually safer because you get less damage to the cobs, less colonization by fungi that make lethal uh, mycotoxins. <coughs> um, and of course you can pose the question, is agriculture safe? And I'm sure uh, some of the people on this line are, 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 know people who've um, had uh, accidents uh, on farms. And uh, so of course agriculture is not completely safe. GM crops are, are at least as safe, if not safer, uh, than agriculture per se. I thought I'd point out some amusing absurdities. So Romania used to export um, GM soybeans to Europe uh, from the late 90s, early, early noughties. And then it, some would say, made the mistake of joining the EU. Once it joined the EU, it could no longer produce Roundup Ready soybeans because it was in the EU and that was uh, not permitted. Um, and so, of course, you know, Romania and especially those farmers became poorer and required EU subsidies. And meanwhile, we bought the same GM soybeans from the US, Brazil and Argentina. And how that's a win for anybody except the US, Brazil and Argentina uh, uh, defeats me. Uh, here's another little one. So, I mean, Italian, Italian pig farmers can grow the, feed their pigs with GM maize grown in Spain, but the, they can't grow GM maize in Italy, so they actually have to import uh, um, the, uh, these, these, this maize from, from Spain. Now, this BT trait, I just wanted to illustrate it here. So if you grow uh, eggplant in uh, uh, aubergine in, in Bangladesh, you've got a real problem with this, uh, uh, this worm. This is this, it's a uh, uh, Lepidopteran larvae that uh, has colonized it. But if you've got BT in there, then that, that's not a problem. And, and that, that's why farmers are embracing this technology in Bangladesh. And I should say, this is not achievable with gene editing. You're going to get sick of this little animation uh, as the uh, presentation unfolds. So like I said, uh, uh, as um, was said, I'm, I work on plant disease resistance and plant immune system. And here's something you, know, you need to know from the outset. All plants actually carry hundreds to thousands of immune receptors. And what these immune receptors do, they, they detect pathogens and activate defense. Plants have got really great defense mechanisms to uh, resist disease, but the key to being a successful pathogen, like a rust or a, a late blight, is to evade detection. And the key to stopping it is to move in extra capacity to detect when the pathogen shows up. So potato late blight, um, <clears throat> we'd like to make potato late blight, potato that's completely immune to potato late blight. It's a devastating pathogen. You can start off with a field like this, and two weeks later, you've got a field like this. Uh, and if it's, you've got a field like this, then it's too late to spray because it's going to end up looking like this. Uh, I hope my arrow is showing up uh, um, within a week. So um, we've been on this road since 1998, actually. We cloned a, a gene in 2008 or so called RPI VNT1, resistance to Phytophthora infestans from Slalom venturii. So this is a field trial we did in Norwich in 2012. And you can see that Desiree potatoes are wiped out and uh, Desiree carrying this gene are not wiped out. But what the other, and this has been licensed to Simplot, um, uh, commercialized in the US and the GM potatoes. So American farmers are benefiting from it, even though this is all paid for by the UK uh, taxpayer. Um, <clears throat> now, one, one thing it's clear is that pathogens evolve quickly to overcome single resistance genes. It's too easy to overcome a single resistance gene, so we need more. And what we did was we went to a, a wild relative of potato called Solanum americanum, a deployed uh, a potato, and um, we've cloned some more genes. I won't go through the details, 
So these are called RPR AMR3 and RPR AMR1, and these are really good resistance genes. And so through clever molecular tinker toys, we've stuck them together uh, along with a, a selectable marker to make transgenic potatoes that carry all three of these genes. And we've also got in on the same tDNA, uh, on the same bit of DNA that we deliver, that's called the transfer DNA or tDNA, um, we silence in the tuber specifically a couple of enzymes that give you um, the bruise phenotype and also promote cold induced sweetening that leads to acrylamide formation when you high temperature cook. Uh, and we just recently on this uh, at uh, tsl.ac.uk, I'm sure you can find this uh, release and update on the project. So we've got lines that um, have these properties. There's no yield penalty, they're complete resistance in tubers as well. Uh, they have reduced bruise damage, re lowered reducing sugars after cold storage. This is a partnership with Simplot and with a, an embryonic uh, startup in the UK called BioPotatoes and Jeff Hooper's on the line. Uh, um, and uh, we, we hope that these lines will help them make them a success. And we've got resistance to potato virus Y and nematode resistance uh, in the pipeline. <clears throat> so what you can see over here is our three RPI gene stack uh, and you've got um, the uh, starting Maris Piper here, uh, which is wiped out by blight and, and this one isn't. And here's the key team players at, at this stage of the project, Marina and Camille. This is a picture from 2018. And we could not have done this with gene editing. Um, and I, I mentioned the tuber blight, so we call this Piper Plus, this improved potato. Uh, this is what happens if you inoculate uh, with blight, doesn't even notice, whereas Maris Piper uh, is uh, rotted fast. Um, and, and the same approach has been used uh, with a couple of different genes by colleagues in Africa, where late blight is an enormous problem for potatoes grown in the upland regions um, of East Africa. And uh, again, same story. We've got something with these genes in, it's fine. Uh, if you've got, uh, well, there used to be some potatoes here now completely wiped out. Um, there's a similar approach being used by our colleagues uh, that, are, that gives us stem rust resistance in wheat. So there, there were three, there's five different resistance genes, stem rust resistance 22, 45, 50, 55, and another one were combined together in a five gene stack into this thing called P60, it's completely immune to stem rust. Stem rust is a massive uh, uh, pathogen and, and part of uh, Norman Borlaug's Nobel Prize, a uh, Peace Prize came about from his introducing stem rust resistance genes into wheat that lasted for a very long time, but have now been overcome. Um, I thought I'd throw this one in because um, I'm sure there are people on the line who, who struggle with black grass and also wild oats. Now, um, classically herbicide resistance, herbicide tolerance has been used uh, to control weeds. And what those do is they kill the weed and, and not the crop. But this is a, a GM technology that has a different approach. You starve the weed and not the crop. You starve the weed for phosphorus, but you don't kill it. So most uh, plants cannot use Phosphite, that's the PO3 form of um, phosphorus, uh, but all apple plants need the phosphorus element. But there's an enzyme from bacteria called PTXD, and if you make the plant uh, express this enzyme, uh, remember an enzyme is just a little machine for doing a job, it can convert phosphite to phosphate, and then the plant can use it. So if you put this PTXD in your crop plant, um, and then you uh, apply phosphite as the source of phosphorus, then your crop wins. So this, this is what we've got here is some tobacco that's got this, uh, PTXD gene and a, and a grass. There's no phosphorus, neither of them grow very well. If you bride phosphate, the grass completely outgrows the uh, tobacco here. But if you've got, if you provide phosphite, then the tobacco crop wins. And I, I don't want to tell you, to promise you this will solve all your wheat problems, what has been so d terrible really of the last 20 years is that we're not even testing ideas like this in UK crops, in UK conditions to see if they work. Uh, and again, this is not achievable with editing. And here's another gene, um, the EFR gene from Arabidopsis, Thalecress. Uh, it's a receptor. It helps you detect when uh, bacterial will, bacteria show up. And um, if you've got this detection capacity from a raptor, so if you put it into tomato, which doesn't have this perception capacity, 
then you get resistance to late plant. And there's dozens of traits like this that could solve crop problems with genetics, not chemistry, all blocked by excessive regulation. Not achievable with editing. Um, and I'm just, I have to show you this nice picture of purple tomatoes, uh, which we hope to be releasing in the US in the next uh, couple of years. But again, without change in regulation, we won't be able to do that here. Um, so what about genome editing? I've referred to editing not over time, not too bad. Um, so editing is what it relies on is another kind of enzyme, an enzyme which will cut DNA and it will cut it at a programmable location, an operator specified location, it'll make a cut. And when DNA is cut in cells, whether it's humans, you know, we, we're always getting having DNA breaks every time our cells replicate or we're out in the sun too long. Um, the, there's a DNA repair process and the DNA repair process mostly works, but it's imperfect. And sometimes it makes mistakes. So if you make cuts at a particular position, and you'll have a repair where you either delete a base or you make you put in a different base. So you get mutations at the position that you have specified the nuclease, uh, the enzyme to cut. Uh, there's actually three kinds of um, outcomes from gene editing uh, processes. And this is again, a, a bit of a simplification. Um, but the, the simplest form, so, so SDN1, site-directed nuclease one, you make a cut and then you just get a, a perturbation and a mutation. So you can make mutate a specific gene with just a few nucleotides change. Um, sometimes you can actually just locally direct quite a few nucleotides to change to the uh, operator specified uh, uh, new sequence. And also you can use, and this is actually much harder to do, we're trying to do it uh, not terribly successfully, is to make a cut and then um, use that to drive in the new DNA we want to put in, for example, a bunch of genes for late light resistance uh, at a new location. That that's works a lot less well, but it does, it, it, does, uh, it does work. So we've used it, for example, to make a, a semi-dwarf um, tomato. Uh, so here's a, a tomato that's smaller than this tomato, and that's because we made a three nucleotide deletion in a gene that's important for plant size. Um, basically, to make the plant get big, you have to get rid of this protein and this change we made in it means it's harder to get rid of for the plant. And so the plant stays smaller for longer. And this is quite useful if, or if you want a more compact plant. So it was a very simple uh, tweak that we published a couple of years ago. Now, the strange thing is that if you do this in the EU, EU it's GM because we use the GM method to put in the site specific nuclease that made the change. Um, and then we crossed out the, the bit of DNA we put in, uh, but we re left behind the change that we'd made. Now under EU regulation, and this is spectacularly irrational, um, even the, the progeny of a plant that has been GM um, is uh, classified as GM, even if the bit of DNA that made it GM has, uh, didn't make it through to that progeny, to, to that uh, seed that derives from the GM plant. Um, it's as if there's sort of some essence of GMness in some ectoplasm-like way that can persist uh, through into that plant, even though the DNA isn't there. And of course, this is just nonsense. Um, and the EU regulates this, uh, sorry, the US regulates this more rationally. If you compare the GM method and the GE methods, um, so GM is mostly about, quotes, killer apps. There'll be something that does insect resistance, you put in a gene that does insect resistance, or your gene that puts, gives you herbicide resistance, or in our case, a few genes for disease resistance or potato tuber quality or, or whatever. Gene editing, um, it, it gives you more, uh, it, it greatly facilitates faster and more efficient plant breeding. Um, uh, and because it essentially enables you to do faster recombination to make the combinations of many minor traits that you want. So here's an example I always give. Let's say you've got a really delicious um, uh, vine tomato from a glass house, and you've also got a not very tasty field tomato uh, for processing. And actually what you'd like to do is to have the taste qualities of your tasty vine tomato um, in the field tomato. So there's a gene called self pruning. And that's the diff main difference between the uh, um, field tomato and the vine tomato. Um, and, the, and the vine tomato is a mutant in the self-pruning gene, with the result that it self-prunes and is more compact. So with editing, 
you can just make a mutation in the self-pruning gene of the vine tomato, and then it's basically a, uh, um, a field tomato. Uh, or you can just make do 10 back crosses recurrently, which takes like you know, th two or three years to bring in that mutant gene into the vine tomato background. Well, it's obviously quicker if you can just make that allele, that form of the gene in the vine tomato background. And this is what plant breeders want to do. Um, so, so that's to me what, what's exciting about uh, uh, using gene editing as a plant breeder, which I'm not. <laughs> um, but there are some killer apps. Um, you could easily make an olive oil like soybean and, and any other oil seed you choose to by mutating some enzymes involved in unsaturated fatty acid synthesis. The people at Rothamsted have made a low acrylamide uh, wheat, lowering levels of asparagine, had a low gluten in wheat, virus resistance, um, sugar beet and brassicas. There's a wonderful story of bacterial blight resistant rice. Uh, there's actually something approved in Japan that's low nutritionally enhanced in um, uh, something, uh, gamma amino butyric acid, which um, for some people is, uh, uh, has a health benefit. Then you can rapidly domesticate or, or adapt uh, architecture. So tomatoes for urban agriculture or, or rapid domestication of either new species or, or uh, ground, something like ground cherry. So more is based on what you know, what genes you know you need to mutate um, to make a, a, a an easily manageable tomato. You can just make those mutations in, in physalis. Wheat blast resistant wheat, something my colleagues here are doing and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of very useful things you could do with it. Uh, so what are the issues with genome editing? And, and um, I'm gonna say here, so this, this is, I did help with the Royal Society submission. I also made my own submission to the consultation. Um, our major message is that we should be regulating the product or the outcome of the gene editing rather than regulating on the basis of the methods been used to achieve it. Although getting there from here is not trivial. trivial. And one thing I would, we are recommending, I think is uh, very important is in the same way as the, there's this Human Embryology and Fertilization Committee, which is um, a consultation body whereby uh, uh, lay people and uh, also experts get together on the same panel and discuss ethical issues or, or other environmental impact issues uh, of a particular technology. Uh, I think it would be helpful to have something like that for agricultural practices, both um, pre-approval and post-approval. Uh, I mean, we talk about the potential risks of using the editing and GM methods, but actually, you know, what about the fact that switching to winter wheat has eliminated or at least reduced habitat for farmland birds? Um, all these practices, the public have a view and we want to bring the public with us in uh, um, making the most of uh, the technologies that will help us meet the sustainability challenges. But we have to have a forum for conversation uh, with them. So that's, that's, that's another part of our recommendations. So, um, I mean, the benefits of this approach would be we'd make innovation more accessible. So if an out -based, outcomes-based approach, reduce regulatory costs, open it up to new players, promoting innovation. We've got to be careful about different rules in different jurisdictions, although I think the EU is going to move on gene editing at least uh, in the next few years. There's a very strong head of steam building up for that to happen. Um, we, there needs to be a, a dialogue between organic agriculture and, and the rest to agree rules for peaceful coexistence. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about intellectual property uh, on the next slide. And I think we also need to enable consumers to know the provenance of their food, whether it's GM maybe, or gene editing maybe, or definitely neither. But I've always thought we'd end up in a place where most food is either GM maybe or gene editing maybe, uh, and, and then you know the organic uh, um, food chain would uh, proclaim its freedom from both technologies uh, and uh, people may or may not choose to uh, buy into that. Um, there's a lot of words on this slide. This is just a paragraph from the impact on electoral property, intellectual property section of the Royal Society submission. And my real point is this, that um, if the plant breeding industry, as they say, wants to um, have gene editing regulated like any other plant breeding technology, then it has to be protected like any other plant breeding technology. They can't file patents on gene editing events because something that's absolutely crucial to food security for the next 10, 20 years is that plant breeders will be able to breed from each other's varieties, the plant breeders uh, rights, plant breeders exemption. 
And um, if they can't do that, then that's not in anyone's interest. And if there's patents filed on these gene editing events, that could preclude that. So, so that would be a bad thing. Now I've put, um, and I'm gonna make this available to uh, um, the hosts. If anybody's interested, but you can see the TSL, my, my Sainsbury Lab has got a statement on gene editing. The Royal Society's got a statement on gene editing. Rothamsted's got a rather good statement on gene editing. So those who are interested in reading more about what the science community have, um, have said, uh, there's places to look. Um, now, what about labeling? I thought I'd throw in this for a lighter touch. I gave a talk at Cold Spring Harbor in, in Long Island a few years ago, and um, I just got to stay overnight there. And, and in the place I was staying, there was a, a, a product called this herbal coffee alternative, and it described itself as 75% organic. Um, I found, well, of course I laughed out loud and asked what on earth does that mean? Uh, uh, or even more colorful language was deployed. Um, but labeling needs to convey meaningful information. So uh, to react to, 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 to sort of re-emphasize some points I've made uh, earlier. We need to stop worrying about using these methods and focus on the real question, what kind of agriculture do we want? There are a lot of well-informed people who care about this, these issues uh, to, uh, that we need to engage in, in thinking ahead on, on answering this question. We need, but I would argue we need something that's sustainable, conserves soil, sequesters carbon, and, and in my view, we need to use genes, not chemicals, to control pests and diseases, and we can do that. Um, we need productive agriculture because yield is good. The more yield we have, the less land we need to, for the amount of food we need. And science is indispensable for making wise choices. And we need to consider the cost of not enabling the techno new technology as well as the hypothetical costs of uh, enabling it. Um, if we can't deploy my late black resident potatoes, we'll just carry on spraying 15 times a year. Um, I just want to make a general point. Never before has there been such tight regulation uh, of completely hypothetical hazards or risks. We need real science-led rules rather than regulating on the basis of um, presumed uh, or anticipated unknown unknowns. You know, the coal industry got regulated because it killed people. The pharmaceutical industry got regulated because it killed people. The GM um, industry has not killed anybody. Um, and I th people talk about the precautionary principle. I think that that's all very well, but there needs to be any time it's enacted or, or acted on, it needs to have built into it a post-cautionary principle so that if five years later, we realize that we were getting our knickers in a twist about nothing, um, we can unpick excessive regulation. So we need to be able to use both the gene editing and the, the GM methods. So I'd like to thank um, some people on the left who really did uh, play a key role in the work. Uh, some entities on the right, particularly BBSRC, who funded the work uh, I've described. Uh, at the Sainsbury Lab. I want to thank David Sainsbury, whose vision um, in founding, in directing the Catsby Foundation to fund the Sainsbury Lab uh, has been um, basically my whole career and activities dependent on it. So thank you very much, Mr. Sainsbury, and um, thanks for your attention. And I'll unshare. I can't hear you, thank you. Uh, Victoria. Thank you. I was just, um, I pressed one button and discovered that I was in a completely different place, uh, which, which was slightly unnerving uh, for me. Um, thank you very much. I'm, I, 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 of course, have, have many, many questions uh, that I would like to ask you about, what's, um, about what you've just told us. It, it, it was eye-opening me to be honest uh to actually bother to have such a lot of, of detail there yeah, about, about what's happening um one of my questions is 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 about in 10 years time um what would your vision be for for your for your patch of east anglia you know with, with land sharing and and land sparing with good um effective use of of genetic technologies how how would you see uh, some of this um, playing out? Well, in terms of local implementations of, of these methods that we could do um, regulation uh, permitting, um, I think we would have, we would have late blight risen potatoes that would need spraying maybe once or twice a year for early blight, uh, but no more needed for, for late blight. Um, 
uh, I'd like to see, um, I, I want to make our varieties uh, uh, available to allotment growers as well. Um, so that uh, I think that if we have allotment growers embracing this technology, then we'll, that'll make the case very strongly that, that, that uh, it's supported by the public, not just by professional farmers. Um, for wheat, for example, um, I, I didn't have a chance to get into this. My colleague, Matt Moscow, um, works on the specialization of um, wheat stripe rust, yellow rust. Uh, so wheat, yellow rust grows on wheat, but it doesn't grow on barley. So he has done genetics on barley to identify the genes in barley that give resistance to um, wheat stripe rust. And of course you get whole fields of barley, millions of plants. And guess what? The wheat stripe rust doesn't break uh, that resistance. So um, if you could get those, turns out there's three genes out of barley into wheat, then you'd have a wheat that is resistant to stripe rust and is likely to be resistant for, for quite a long time. I mean, never bet against the pathogen forever, but I think you'd get resistance for quite a long time. I'd like to see our nematode resistance and potato virus Y resistance traits uh, in these lines, in our potato lines. Um, we, um, we, uh, what, what, we, what we, you know, Potato, sea potatoes are produced in Scotland because in Scotland uh, there's, it, it's uh, historically been too cold for the aphids to thrive that um, transmit the virus. But if we've got virus resistant potatoes, then maybe we don't need to worry about that. We actually have a sea potato industry uh, in Norfolk. And um, that would, um, of course, get around the devolved administration with differing views of GM problem. Um, so uh, let's see what else. So, so I'd love to see some of these editing traits uh, deployed as well. So I mentioned the Rothamsted uh, edited wheat for um, reduced. Uh, what, what it does is, is, is it, it, they made some mutations by sort of tweaking with these nucleases genes uh, that are involved in making asparagine. And the acrylamide that is made in high temperature cooking results from a chemical reaction between asparagine uh, and amino acid and uh, reducing sugars, i.e. glucose or fructose. So if you lower the amount of asparagine, um, then you lower the amount of acrylamide that's made, and that's a good thing. And reciprocally, that's what we're doing in potato. We're lowering the amount of, re lowering the amount of reducing sugar, which gives us lower amounts of acrylamide on high temperature cooking. Um, I could, you know, uh, well, I'm acting lyrical here. Yeah, I don't, I don't want, <laughs> but um, those, those, are, those are a few examples. Uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to see this um, phosphite utilization uh, trade tested for um, controlling black grass and, and, and wild oats in, in cereals. I really think it uh, might work. It wouldn't work initially because m many soils have phosphate reserves already there, so those would have to be depleted before it would actually give the crop much of a competitive advantage. Um, but anyway, that's another example of something that would be valuable to test. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think um, you might actually be canonised if you found the answer to the black grass problem. <laughs> um, we've got people probably on, on both sides of, of the debate here, and I'll come back to some of my questions a bit later if I have time. But I'd like to ask um, Tim Breitmeier, um, ex-president uh, of the CLA, uh, to step in uh, now, if he if he unmutes and um, switches on his video so that he can ask you his question himself. I've got so many there. I'm with you. I'm with you. There he is. I was in the middle of typing, but my typing wasn't very good on my small keypad. Um, Jonathan, I'm a sugar beet farmer. And uh, as you know, we got wiped out this year um, by virus yellows, which is a fungal disease um, for those who aren't sugar beet farmers. Um, and probably many people saw their crop reduced by anything up to 60%. Just how close do you think um, a virus yellow solution is with gene editing? I am not very close to it, but I've heard, um, I think someone from Van der Harver give a talk in which he claimed uh, that it would greatly accelerate bringing uh, yellow resistant varieties to market. But I, I, I don't have any inside knowledge on that one. But the industry claims that there's uh, that if with this technology it would accelerate deployment. So no, no quick fix. I don't, you know, I haven't seen uh, the their data. 
you know, it's, it's uh, uh, I think it's Van der Haag. For, the, for those who are not close to the industry, there was an absolutely perfect solution, which was um, a seed dressing, which sadly was a neonicotinoid, uh, and that got withdrawn 12 months ago, albeit the government did um, give it an emergency license for this year if we um, went above a certain threshold, which actually we failed with the cold weather in February at the last moment. So this kind of make, make a general point, which is that, um, you know, like, like I've said several times, I, I want to replace chemistry with genetics. So what you really don't want to do is to get rid of chemistry and then not be able to replace it with genetics. Um, the two, the two must be simultaneous. That we'll be get, that we'll get genetics um, solutions to this virus. Um, but um, I'm not close enough to, to that project to, to be able to comment on the rate at which it might show up. Thank you. Um, if anybody is having trouble typing their questions into the chat bar, if you, um, if you un undo your video so I can see you and wave vigorously, uh, then I will invite you to ask your question. Um, and if you're not on my front page, what you have to do is clear your throat and then having unmuted, and then your picture will jump to the front page. Little little tip there if you ever want to be noticed. Um, so somebody is waving. It says Simon S. Uh, thank you, Vivian. Uh, uh, John, sorry, it's Victoria. Uh, I'll just no, correct Victoria, that. Sorry, Victoria. <laughs> my apologies, uh, Victoria. Uh, I'll, read, I'll read. I'll put my glasses on. Uh, Jonathan, I thought that was an excellent presentation, and thank you thank for you. that. Um, do you think the government has the appetite to support the science? And also, is anyone looking at diseases in woodland forestry? For example, we grow cricket bat willow, and we have watermark in that. I also grow willow for um, a Jewish festival, and we get played with uh, rust in the willow mm -hmm. there. So resistance to rust on that would be welcome. Um, but first of all, has the government, does the government have the appetite to support the science? And secondly, is there any work being done on forestry, which is going to become more important going forward as well? Thank you, Victoria. Um, I think the the government. I think the government has the appetite to change the regulation on um, gene editing, uh, so to to basically abolish being um, dominated by the EU regulations. What I'm less certain of, I'm sort of cautiously hopeful, but waiting to have my hopes dashed, uh, is the extent to which um, the use of the GM method will also be uh, relaxed. But um, you know, the reason I sort of animated in. Uh, repeatedly uh, could not be done with editing um, is that you know if, if the Prime Minister really wants the blight resistant crops that will feed the world as he said on the steps of Downing Street in July 2019 whenever it was um, then he needs we need the GM method as well as the um, gene editing methods and and something that gives me hope is that uh, George Eustace at the Oxford Farming Conference uh, this year talked about um, what he called um, cisgenesis. There's, it's, it's, it doesn't really have a formal definition of what is cisgenesis, and I've never liked it because it involves capitulating to the argument, which as you'd expect I'm uncomfortable with, that there's anything wrong with transgenics. But nevertheless, uh, at least from a marketing standpoint, uh, cisgenics are, um, is a term applied to when you've moved a gene using the GM method between closely related species rather than between, you know, its most extreme, you know, a fish and a plant or whatever. Uh, so all of the DNA that is in our um, uh, potato lines uh, is DNA that came from a Solanum species. Um, so either from tomato or Solanum americanum or actually from potato. And that would be true also for the genes we're going to have that have PVY, potato virus Y resistance and also for nematode resistance. So George Eustace said that um, cisgenesis is, is a much more acceptable uh, form of using the GM method effectively. And everything that we do fits the government's definition of cisgenesis. So um, I'm hopeful that they will say that uh, you know, where, where genes move between closely related species, there is less cause for alarm and a more relaxed regulatory framework. Um, so that, that's the first part of your question. Uh, the the um, Tree uh, engineering, of course, tree diseases like rusts and, and um, uh, watermark of, of willow don't get anything like the uh, investment from BVSRC or anywhere else. Um, and also, the um, when you see people 
uh, commenting on some of the GM tree projects, like with eucalyptus or, or uh, even the chestnuts in, in the US, great alarm is expressed at the fact that this you know, trait will pollinate, because it's windblown pollen, right? So you know, the pollen will get around. Uh, and um, so the, the, there's, there's a PR challenge um, with that, that the industry will have to help um, manage, I would say. I mean, I think that if you have a rust resistance genes, um, and uh, I couldn't tell you exactly where I'd look for them, it's a lampsure, I think, uh, <coughs> causes the rust of willows, but um, there are genes being defined that confer resistance in poplar and, and other uh, trees. So conceivably, if you moved them out of poplar into willow, you, you'd get a useful new resistance. But there's a lot of research before that's anything like deployable. Thank you. I mean, I, I think that um, tree diseases are now more in the public perception than they have mm. with ash dieback in particular. I think, but I think by um, by having no uh, GM kind of focus in Europe, we, we've outsourced the research to America. So they worked on their chestnut blight uh, resistance and, and came up with some results. Is there anybody else who is um, would like to ask a question uh, by coming, uh, just undoing their video? I know I've got a couple that have been sent to me uh, to one side. Um, ah, I recognize that person. <laughs> Paris, we'd like to ask a question. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? Yeah, good. How are you? Very, very good. I thought, uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and music to my ears, as you know. Um, I thought, listening to you, that um, being a Cornishman and one of our traditional industries is in the sea and the depletion of sea stocks. I'm particularly interested in omega oils. And um, um, you know where I'm going to go with this conversation is is where are we with omega oils being produced by plants and what are the challenges, please? Yes, okay, now having a comment on that, I mean this is the work of um, another Jonathan, uh, <coughs> Jonathan Napier, uh, he misspells his name with an extra H, uh, but uh, he's at Rothamsted and he's been working on this for a very long time. Um, he, what he, the key point is this, that the, the, the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids that are particularly beneficial for heart health are not made by any plant. There are some polyunsaturated fatty acids in evening primrose oil or whatever, but actually it's not the long chain acids that you need that are, that are good for you. Um, in order to make those uh, so-called LC poofers, uh, is you need to get a gene from a, a bacteria, a, a cyanobacterium, a photosynthetic bacterium in, in the ocean. And, you know, uh, the, uh, the, bacteria, the bacteria are eaten by little critters that are eaten by bigger critters that are eaten by bigger critters that are eaten by fish. And that's how we get these uh, fatty acids in our diet. And what ga the ghastly thing that happens at the moment is that, you know, pilchards and sprats or whatever all over the world are essentially mined from the sea and then put into salmon farm fish feed. Um, so, uh, what's been done is to engineer an oilseed crop, not oilseed rape actually, but a close relative called camelina, to accumulate large amounts of this oil, this long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. And um, it's possible to uh, um, convert these, uh, uh, this, this camelina uh, source into fish feed that will then mean that those oils get into the salmon diet in fish farms. Um, I would say that also, and I think Jonathan admits this, um, from a sustainability standpoint, you know, there's a lot to be question, to question about fish farming because you get all the sea lice build up and, and you know, ghastly animal welfare for the fish. Um, so in fact, the, an alternative is to turn this uh, long chain poofer, LC poofer into uh, capsules that you take like any other fatty acid that you might take. Um, you know, we'll, many of us may take our omega-3 cod liver oil, whatever, uh, uh, pastels in the morning. So anyway, but it's quite well advanced. I think that the, um, I, I would say it, it cannot be classified as cisgenic because it involves a, a gene from bacterium being expressed in the uh, developing oil seed. Um, it has used gene editing to just tweak the amounts of um, the source material that gets converted into the end product we want. Um, but it's, it's pretty well advanced and gene editing would be helpful uh, and of course the market will decide 
route where, which it takes to either to humans either directly or via salmon. Could you just clarify, is, does that fit within um, um, current DEFRA guidance then from, from our DEFRA minister? Is well, it, it's a GM crop. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Um, I've got one more question, which I think we've got time for, which is actually a kind of an amalgamation of two different questions uh, from Susan Twining and from Judy Kale. Hammond, which is really about uh, your your point on on having a body like the HEFC, and and Susan's question is in the chat bar there. How can we best deal with fear or suspicion of GE and GM, uh, which is a hangover of the 1990 Frankenstein food uh, headlines? Do, do do you think that having a body which is there to talk about these things publicly it is, is is in essence the answer? Well, I don't think anybody knows what's a magic wand to wave, wave over this problem. Uh, and if we knew what it was, we'd have done it long ago. Um, the, the, um, I think that if you can engage with those who have concerns and have a conversation round a table with them rather than sort of broadcasting on Twitter at each other, you're going to make a bit more progress. And, and particularly if the, all of the conversations are essentially recorded and, 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 and notes are made and everybody uh, can see them and there's full transparency. Um, you know, there's other things that are different. So in, in the 90s, um, the Daily Mail loathed Tony Blair and, and they, I think they used the GM issue as a stick to beat him with. And so, you know, the Daily Mail was, came up with this term Frankenstein, Frankenstein food, I think, Franken food. And it was, you know, kind of relentless uh, and it hasn't quite learned how to stop. But I think if Boris Johnson says it's a really good idea, then um, I think the Daily Mail is actually less vocal in opposing it. And, and it's a very influential uh, uh, organ. And of course, I mean, like I say, I'm not um, the world's greatest fan of Brexit, but the <laughs> Daily Mail is in a sort of slightly contradictory position because it's of course argued for it. Uh, to free us up to make our own rules and regulations. Well, of course, this, I mean, my personal view is this is the only thing I can think of as a Brexit dividend, which is that, you know, we, we free up uh, a, a regulation of this technology uh, so that it's, it's based on, um, on science rather than uh, uh, anxiety. And so, so anyway, with the, with the position of the Daily Mail remains to be seen, I think, on this. Um, I, you know, the, People like me and, and, uh, and a, few, a few others have engaged, but we need to continue to engage, you know, not just with other scientists, but with members of the public. And, and, and this is why I'm always very happy to do the kind of thing I'm doing now, which is uh, you know, to speak to people who care about these issues, but are not scientists, um, to, uh, to help them grasp uh, the issues. And I also try and engage with um, opponents of the technology, people like uh, Pat Thomas from Beyond GM, uh, Lawrence uh, Woodward of uh, the, the uh, Organic Agriculture Centre near, near Banbury. Um, you know, I talk to these people and I think, um, the, the, anyway, so you, you have to have the courage of your convictions and I, I persist with the courage of my convictions that, um, that truth will out uh, eventually. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think, um... As I said, you know, if there, are, there are some answers which uh, could have <clears throat> increased yields or, or reduce the interference of, of, of blights and, and rusts and so on would make an enormous difference and would probably pull a lot of agriculturalists um, in behind your view if, 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 if they had the arguments at their fingertips that said, um, you know, that there is a journey to be travelled with the precautionary principle but it, it can't be um, it, it can't be a never ending one. Well, we've gone over our time, I'm afraid, Jonathan. But that's that's great. I have I have a whole big pile of questions which I will now have to ask you in a more informal setting, um, perhaps uh, later this year. Um, it's been so interesting and so informative uh, for us, uh, you know, to to have you give us the science, probably beginner level, I mean, almost certainly beginner level science from your point of view, but for some of us, you know, concentrate now uh, and you might uh, understand a lot of this. So thank you very, very much. Um, uh, and thank you on behalf of London Branch, 
and thank you on behalf of the CLA and the wider membership. And there is our Deputy President, Mark Tuffnell, who's just come on to, to wave his thanks as well. Uh, and thank you everybody for attending. My pleasure.